Hi, I'm Linda Kenny Bodden. Welcome back to the Law and Crime Network. We have a very special segment today. Uh, our guests on the special segment are going to discuss a number of things relating to the exonerated Central Park Five, the uh, movie that was on Netflix in four parts, When They See Us. Our guests are Terry Rosenblatt. Terry is the head of the DNA section of the Legal Aid Society of New York and our amazing special guest, an advocate, a lawyer, fellow lawyer, and an exoneree, Jeff Deskovich, who uh, I've gotten to know in the past few days. Welcome to the Law and Crime Network. Thank you very much. All right, so let's look at the controversy now behind the Central Park Five that has been created by this movie when they see us. Is my mom here? It's just us. You and us. Who you in the park with? I don't know names. I just got lost. Where did you see the lady? One, one lady. The female jogger was severely beaten and raped. Every black male who was in the park last night is a suspect. I need all of them. What's going on with my son? Your son was involved in a rape in Central Park. What? No, 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 wait a minute. No, no, wait a second, wait a second. They saw you rape the lady. I didn't see a lady or hit anyone. I didn't see any lady. Kevin. I didn't see any lady. I want to see my son right now, right now. Whatever they said I did, I didn't. I know what. On the road. Nothing these boys state matches the central facts of the crime. All we need is for one to tie this whole thing together. These tapes are not as clean as the state would have you believe. There is injustice happening here. There is not one shred of evidence. Imagine the frenzy of these teenagers. Ripping off her they are innocent of these crimes. They are guilty. Doing us like this. What other way they ever do us? And I haven't looked back. Well, I know when I watched it, I couldn't pick myself off the floor, but we have somebody here, Jeff Deskovich. You lived it. You were actually picked up. You were arrested when you were 16 years old, like the Central Park Five exonerated. You were convicted when you were 17, and you did how many years in a maximum security prison in New York State? 16. 16 years in a maximum security, and you were innocent, correct? Yes. And tell us, the, we have somebody who wrote, who was a former DA at the Manhattan DA's office. He wrote this article on our website. You can get it on our website, longcrime.com. And he said it's actually worse in terms of the evidence that was not presented to the jury or presented false to the jury. He said there were hairs that were uh, allegedly attributed to these young men, to the Central Park a jogger on these young men. Uh, and then the uh, prosecutor at the time, Elizabeth Letter, said that they were a match. And it turns out not only did the, the analysts not say they were a match, which is a very bad scientific term used very sparingly, but the DNA later came back and said it was not them. You had the similar situation with hairs and, and DNA in, yours, in your case, right? Yes, the DNA didn't match me, and the hairs found on the victim's body were uh, from ne uh, negroid and mongoloid uh, origin. Okay, so so when you were tried in 1990, there was they the FBI did a one-on-one -on -one match of the hairs on the person who was raped and killed. She was 16 years old. Her initials were AC, and they excluded you conclusively, right? Yeah, well, they did it. Just to clarify, they did a match as to the seminal fluid, not the hairs. The victim. The was seminal fluid. But it did not match me. I, but the hairs also didn't match you. Also did to not me, match you me. Are, you're white. You're Caucasian, right? I am. I am. Yeah, so you're not, you're not of uh, Asian descent. I'm not. You are not of African-American descent. Correct. And it turns out later the person who, who did kill AC was of African-American descent. Correct. Right? Correct. And later on, you, you the prosecution fought to have your DNA not put in a database that came in existence somewhere around 1996, right? 1997, 98, yes. 97, 98. For Correct. two years they fought. They fought, and it turns out finally, when you had now the chief justice of, of the, the head ju ju justice of the New York Supreme Court, uh, she allowed it. Yes. And what did they find? Yeah, it matched the actual perpetrator. 
who was who, whose DNA was in the data bank because he killed a second victim three and a half years later as a result of him remaining free while I was doing time for his. He crime. killed a woman named Miss Morrison, right? Yes, he did. And and that's similar to Central Park. The DNA later came back to match some Matthias Reyes, right, Terry? Yes. Uh, in a data bank, and the data banks weren't in existence when either Jeff was tried initially or the Central Park was tried, but they came in existence when in New York. That's right. So the national database started around 1994, and then there was a state database in New York that went online in about 1996, and that was because of a change in the kind of DNA testing that was done from what was originally done at the time of the Central Park Five case to the type that's done now. And, and so it came back to this Matthias race, who also killed a woman who was pregnant, right? After this, after after the CP5, the Central Park Five were exonerated. That's right. He went on to. So you have two situations. Both uh, in some situations, young teenagers. Both were tried. Both were wrongfully convicted. The DNA didn't match. The hair testimony didn't match, and yet they were convicted. Jeff, how do we change this? I think that I think that whatever, whichever way the evidence goes is the way that was is the way that um, a case should be looked at instead of tunnel vision, which is you forming a conclusion and then excluding everything to the contrary to that or coming up with some bizarre explanation. Right, and in fact, I tweeted a lot of the similarities between your case and the cent exonerated Central Park Five case, whose names are Anton McCray, Antron McCray, Kevin Richardson, Yusuf Salam, Raymond Santana, and Corey War Corey Rise. Well, we don't have them here, but we have you here, and you are you. It, it, the fact that this happened to you when you were told your mother told the police not to talk to you, right? Yes. And they found in your case that your confession was forced and coerced, also, right? Yes. You gave a false confession. Yes. Just like the Central Park Five. Yep. Just like the exonerated five. So you're vulnerable, you were young, uh, you didn't do it. There were hairs that didn't match, that di didn't come from you. There was DNA that didn't come from you. And yet, you, you, somehow the jury got misled. This, there was a report that was done by uh, uh, now Judge Justice Fiore who said that the jury had been misled, right? Yes. Yes, you commissioned a four-person study that on uh, what went wrong in my in my case, and it was uh, as the the report put it, there was a perfect storm here. Of, so a lot of mistakes on on everybody all around the board. Well, but there's a perfect storm, and according to the exonerated Central Park Five, the movie When They See Us, is a perfect yes. storm in a lot of situations. Is a perfect storm in your case. It can't be a perfect storm. It has to be something wrong with the system if it allows people like you. And by the way, you are now you've got your master's degree in, in wrongful convictions. You are now a lawyer. I mean, it, just. How old are you now? I'm 45. 45. But half of your life was taken away in a maximum security men's prison when you went there and you were 17 years old. Correct. So what do we do? I think that we need to have a, a series of reforms passed in order to prevent this from happening. So for example, we need to videotape interrogations from beginning to end. The legislature a few years ago did pass a law mandating that, but they made exceptions for second degree murder, sex offenses, and drug cases. So we need to circle the wagons in terms of that. Uh, definitely we need to have a equal playing field between the prosecutor's office and the public defender's office. There's still way too many cases that public defenders have at the same time. There's still a dramatic uh, disparity in terms of manpower and financial resources. We need to even it up. One side is not doing a more important job than the other. They're both essential for, for justice. And, and Terry, you said that the DNA is now also possibly being misused by law enforcement, having all these little databases that don't report to anybody. That's right, Linda. So. There's one kind of DNA that you can talk about sort of the traditional gold standard DNA. You have a single source that comes from a crime scene, like the sperm evidence from the Central Park Five case, and you compare that to a single source from a suspect, right? That's, that's traditional DNA testing. Right. But that's not what most DNA testing is, and most people don't know that, right? So DNA testing now can test things that are touched, like if I touch something, touch this, okay. right? I leave behind DNA. Right. DNA testing can be sensitive enough to look at one single human skin cell. And you think about what a crime scene could be, right? A crime scene could be like your local Dunkin' Donuts. And if that's a crime scene. Which are where I used to work, by the yeah, way. So, so the Dunkin' Donuts where you used to work, let's say that, God forbid, someone got murdered there. And the police go and they look for all of the different skin cells of all the different people who might have touched that area. And they develop profiles and they compare those profiles. And let's say they're comparing those profiles not to a regulated and transparent national database of folks who have been convicted of serious offenses, but instead of a database that's built by the local police department. 
that includes children, that includes people who haven't been charged with crimes, that includes people whose only commonality is that the police have decided to put them there. Well, in, right? in terms of commonality, uh, Betty Gershman, who was the law professor, former Manhattan District Attorney's office, he was in that office, who wrote the article that started all this, that's why we're looking at it. He also uh, is responsible for helping you get into Pace University, where you've, you've done him proud, and you've done all of us proud. But uh, when he talked even about the hair, uh, when you said it was consistent with, when the experts said it was consistent with, what he said is like saying like one bicycle could be like a car because they have wheels. That's, that's all it means, right? Yes, it's an artwork. It's an art word. So what is the legal system using art words for when somebody like you could go to jail for half of your life when you were a teenager? And your, your big crime, according to the police, because they had a profile, was that you cried because a 16-year-old classmate had been killed. Yes. And, and you honored her, right? Mm -hmm. yes. and, 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 the, and her family thought you did it for years. And, and you didn't, leading to the death of these two, uh, the death of the other person in your case, and also in the Central Park Five case. Sure. So, so an art word. Did you know this when you were a kid? Did you? Did no. you? Did you? Could you? Could you participate when you were 17 in your own defense? And as 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 Justice DeFiore's report said, you were vulnerable. You were vulnerable because you were a, basically a child. Could yeah. you participate in your defense? I could not. No. Right. And and part of the problem we can get into some other time is your defense attorney also kind of missed the boat, right? Yes. But you also had other kind. You, you sued, you yeah. sued uh, civilly. Uh, as I disclosed, my husband was your expert in terms of medical, we, we discovered last night out of the blue, in terms of the medical examiner and proprieties. The medical examiner even um, kind of, according to your lawsuit, uh, put his testimony to uh, jive, shall we say, with the police version, right? Yes. Yeah, exactly. Well, he, yes. So, what? Well, after the DNA didn't match me, which was six months after doing the initial autopsy, he suddenly remembered, right, in order to help the prosecutor overcome the DNA, that he forgot to document medical evidence showing that the victim had been sexually active, which is what allowed the prosecutor to argue that, it, that she was basically sleeping around, that that, that that was why the DNA didn't match me, not that I was innocent. And he later admitted in, in, the, that in the discovery process of the lawsuit that what he claimed he saw on the slides to justify making that statement didn't actually exist. Well, you know, if, if indeed people aren't going to be independent, Jeff uh, Deskovich, uh, again, uh, attorney, activist for wrongful convictions. As a matter of fact, you have a foundation that helps. You're helping about 11 people trying to prove their innocence right now. There's 11 right? active cases, and we've uh, helped seven wrongfully convicted people get home. All right, and, and an exoneree who's been through it, because we can talk about it, ladies and gentlemen, but, and we can feel it, right? We can feel it by watching these shows, but we haven't been in a maximum security prison for years upon years for a murder and a homicide or a rape that we didn't do. Jeff. Redeskovich has. So, Jeffrey, I ask you one other question with regard to this. When they finally put your DNA into the database and it did not match, did anyone come to you and say, I apologize? No, none of the people that were involved in my case ever apologized. Oh, God. I, I, I tell you, it is, let me just say you, ladies and well, gentlemen. Well, you know, that, that's that, another commonality with the Central Park Five. No and not one only has did ever not, apologized. Not, did they not, not only did they not get an apology, but in many quarters, including certain parts of the system, they still are claiming that the boys are guilty. And ladies and gentlemen, and that's let me, disgusting to me. Let me it just say to you, it's if disgusting. it could happen to Jeff Deskovich, I mean, a lot of people want to talk about race. Yes, race can be involved, but Jeff Deskovich could be your son. He could be my brother. He could be a husband. He could be anybody. He could be you. He could be I. If it could happen to him, it could happen to you and any single person you love because the system has to be fair. It has to follow the scientific evidence fairly no matter where it may lead. We do not want any more wrongful convictions. We do not want any scientific evidence in the courtroom that is bad. We do not want to happen what, to what happened to Jeff, to happen to me, to Terry, or possibly even to you again, Jeffrey Deskovich. Right, and on and, and that note, you know, <clears throat> I want to quickly say, you know, I want to again call on Governor Cuomo, appoint commissioners to the Commission on Prosecutor Conduct, which was passed, which he signed into law, which is designed to prevent things like this from happening because it addresses prosecutorial misconduct. He still has not appointed any of the commissioners to that law, to the Commission on Prosecutor Conduct.
And that's the advocate that we brought and bring here today to Law and Crime. If you want to see more about the comparisons, I did tweet some comparisons. Uh, Linda, uh, Kenny Bodden uh, on Twitter, at Kenny Bodden, and you can see the comparisons. Uh, thank you all for being with us. Thank you both for being with us.